Welcome back. Let's Get Physical Therapy is an educational podcast brought to you by MedStar Health and hosted by me, physical therapist Becca Schumer. I will be sharing the mic with tons of healthcare professionals with the goal of educating and inspiring fellow PTs and future PTs. We hope you find this both informative and inspirational, ultimately optimizing how we treat our patients and grow as professionals. Please enjoy today's episode. Today on the podcast, we have Kala Flagg. She's a graduate of the Howard University Physical Therapy Program. She spent over 10 years as a rehabilitation coordinator for the University of Maryland College Park Athletic Department and has over 15 years experience working with professional athletes in various sports, including football, basketball, track and field, and many more. Currently, she's serving as the head PT for the Washington Mystics and treats athletes and patients at our Lafayette site in Washington, D.C., We're excited to dive more into ACL rehab with you today from the clinic level all the way to the pro. Enjoy. Welcome, Kala, to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you today to talk all about ACL rehab with athletes. So welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start out just hearing your physical therapy journey. Why did you become a PT? Where has your career led you? Give it all to us. Yeah, so that's that's kind of an interesting road. So I started out, I guess, initially being interested in PT because my brother got injured playing football when we were in high school. And I kind of always knew I wanted to do something in medicine or was interested in medicine. But for some reason, the idea of med school just didn't sound appealing to me. So I found out about this thing called physical therapy. And I actually started shadowing PTs when I was in high school. And then when I got to college, I found out um, that there were also, you know, athletic trainers. So I kind of started shadowing them and just kind of took off from there. I pretty much knew that I wanted to work with athletes or at least active populations. So that's really kind of the direction that my career has gone in. Um, although I have done a lot of time working in clinics and I've done some pediatrics and a little bit of nursing home kind of, you know, skilled nursing as well. So I like to say that all of it influences the other. I've learned something in every setting that it's helped me in the next. So, um, no experiences are lost as far as I'm concerned. Um, but from clinic, I ended up being the rehabilitation coordinator for University of Maryland. For 12 years for all of the for most of the sports, um, which was a new position that they had developed at the time. And I got a chance to really work with some great athletic trainers and strength coaches and, um, you know, coaches for different teams. I learned a lot about a lot of different sports that I really didn't know before. Like I knew the track and basketball and football and a little bit of the others, but I really didn't know the differences between like men's and women's lacrosse. And I didn't know the requirements of water polo and why all these, you know, girls were ending up with knee injuries and back injuries. And so it really helped to, to broaden um, my horizon as a PT. And then from there, I've, you know, worked with a lot of professional athletes privately. Um, I have worked and toured with a um, dance company out of New York called the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. So I've done that for about six years. And um, the pandemic kind of came. And at that point, I decided, you know what, I want to take a step back. And so I started teaching in a PT department for a little while. And then I, you know, since I had some free time and some time alone, I started to work in the WNBA bubble and the NBA G League bubble. And I got a chance to go to the Olympics with an athlete that I was working with privately, who's a triple jumper from a small Caribbean country. And um, so I just kind of got back into sports that way. Um, And so for the past year, I've been the um, head of rehabilitation for the Washington Mystics WNBA team as they kind of look to restructure their um, sports medicine staff. And now I have a dual role between the Mystics and MedStar. So here I am. (laughs) That's such a cool journey. And I think it highlights that I know a lot of new grads coming out of school that want to just go straight into sports yeah. and think like it's just that's like the one route that they can take, not realizing there's so many different avenues to get there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. and just meeting people along the way. I mean, I did a lot of stuff 
early on just volunteering and not, you know, really getting paid for it and um, just making myself available in certain situations so that um, I could get the experience. And then it just happened to work out that at some point along the way, somebody that I met knew somebody who needed, you know, a PT athletic trainer, and it just kind of opened up from there. So, um, you know, definitely your experiences can go a long way. And I've been able to reach back and do the same thing for a lot of the students that have worked with me in the past as well. So, um, I'm, you know, it, it definitely is a cycle and I, I'm a firm believer in mentorship and helping others because eventually, you know, you're going to get tired and you're going to, somebody's going to need to be able to do the work. I, I love that. It's, it's so important that we take students and get, pay it back, pay it forward, not Absolutely. Pay, it, pay it forward. Absolutely. Well, so today's topic, we're talking all about ACL rehab. I'm sure mm-hmm. in your career, you've seen a lot of patients and athletes post-op ACL and maybe some that didn't need surgery. I'm curious your kind of perspective from getting athletes prehab all the way to return to play how how do you work that into your schedule how often are you seeing these athletes obviously it's a little different because you work for a professional team so that's a little different than it would be in a normal outpatient clinic but take it from there wherever you want to take it yeah I mean it 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 definitely there ranges right working in a clinic initially I would try to see the athletes you know two to three times a week to really just drive home you know those early exercises, um, even from the the prehab, getting the range of motion, getting the quad strength, um, trying to work on gait and just introducing some things that I know are going to be painful and difficult for them afterwards so that it's not totally shocking that, oh, my God, I have to move my knee. <laughs> you know, even though there is still some some shock and some fear, it's it's something that they're at least a little bit familiar with. Um, and then again, post-op trying to get them in two to three times a week, if possible, just depending on the schedule, um, for the first three to four weeks at least. And then, you know, if they're coming three times a week and they're showing that they're compliant with their exercises then, and that they're making progress, I'll try to take them down to two. Ideally, I'd love to see everybody every day. Um, but you know, we're also trying to manage insurance and number of visits allowed and things like that. So I'm a firm believer from day one and making the athlete, um, accountable for their own journey and their own rehab. So I'm big on the home exercise program. I'm big, especially if they're a young athlete on getting the family involved. Um, I really try to push as much independence as possible because even if they are coming to see us every day, five hours a week is still not enough for them to make the progress that they need to make. So they have to know that, you know, that there are some things that they have to do. Um, on the flip side, obviously in professional sports, it's a lot different. So, and even on, you know, the collegiate level, a lot of time, um, we are seeing the athletes every day. Sometimes even on the weekend, we usually try to give them at least one day off, um, but sometimes twice a day. Um, in the college level, I would see them in the morning and then I would see them again afternoon when classes were over. Um, even if it's just to work on range of motion, controlling the effusion, um, pain management, and then just really hammering home those, those basics of straight leg raises, the weight bearing, anything to try to get the quad firing as soon as possible. Um, if there's not some other, you know, concomitant injury like a, a meniscus repair or something like that that doesn't allow us to advance them as quickly. Um, if they are on the pro level, a lot of times we're spending five, six hours a day just with one patient. Just, you know, okay, you get here at nine, you leave it, you know, two or three o'clock, we'll take a break to eat. But <laughs> there's enough stuff between myself, between the strength coach who may want to get them in and just at least do some upper body lifting or, you know, something like that. We're doing a lot of management. Um, So yeah, it it varies, but that doesn't mean that the person who's seen twice a week can't get good results just because they're not coming in every day. Like it's their full-time job. Yeah. I think that that education piece is, is critical. Because patients, like in the pro level, that's their job. Their job is 
their body to rehab versus someone, you know, a high school student, they're going to school and they're doing all these other activities. And then we have people in their 20s, 30s, 40s who are working full time jobs and also trying to rehab. So it's yeah, it's challenging to work with. Sure. All over the place. Sure. I mean, I did a interview several years ago um, with the Washington Post, and that was one of the questions, you know, how come professional athletes get better so much faster than the average person? And, you know, you could talk about all of the bells and whistles and the, all of the, um, you know, just the different modalities that we have and the underwater treadmills, and the, you know, the ultra G and all that other kind of stuff. But it really comes down to just being there <laughs> and being consistent and compliant with what they're being asked to do. And so I told the reporter, I was like, you know, this is their job. Are you willing to come in and do this six hours a day? And they were like, whoa, that's a lot, <laughs> you know? So that that to me is is really the biggest difference. And, and of course, being surrounded by people who are knowledgeable and know, you know, how to progress you forward is important. And they're, they're dialed in with sleep, nutrition, mm-hmm. stress management. They have all these professionals, psycho- like even psychologists probably, you can speak to that. So they have all these variables covered compared to regular patient in the outpatient clinic. They have family stressors and maybe they have exams and financial constraints. And they're just, it makes it a lot harder. And I think educating yep. patients on that and telling them like, yeah, this is going to be hard because you have all these other things to worry about. Yeah. It's very important. It's, it's Mm -hmm. so key because the shock, you know, we've all seen the shock factor (laughs) after the surgery. Like I had no idea it was going to be like this. So it definitely helps uh, for that education piece. I'm sure you encounter athletes that are gung ho to go full throttle out of the gates, Mm -hmm. but then I'm sure there's other athletes that, I've treated pro athletes myself who just aren't doing their stuff at home mm-hmm. and, and it's really challenging and they're coming in with the extension that's not at zero or hyper extended yet with like four to six weeks out. How do you manage those more challenging patients and athletes? Yeah, I mean, I think that really comes down to a couple of things. It's definitely the psychological piece, right? So I, I do advocate for getting the the you know, psychology, the sports psychologist or the mental health professional involved as early as possible. And even, you know, talking about a prehab, like it's a blow. It's it's definitely something that you don't plan for. You don't think that you're going to have to sit home and, you know, while everybody else is, um, you know, continuing to play or train or whatever the case may be. So it, it can be very difficult. And a lot of times that plays out in different ways, including not doing the home exercises, not keeping up with what they're supposed to be doing. So I think the psychological piece is huge, um, but it's often a sensitive conversation. And, and, you know, but at the same time, we have to have it. Um, I try to be very upfront with people about what the expectations are and the importance, not just okay, do these exercises. No, I need you to do this because if your knee is not straight, then the graft is not going to set properly. And then your, your quadriceps not going to function. And then, you know, so there's not just a time on a, on a calendar that says, oh, at X number of months, I'm going to be able to play. Like all of these things have to be able to line up. And if you don't do the work early, then you're not going to be able to get the results when you want them. So I know it's hard, but you know, you're going to have to push through and, and do that. And then I, I also, I I tend to be a little bit blunt. Like I can be very nurturing and just, okay, you needed, you need a few minutes to cry, let's cry, you know, but at some point we also have to get some work done. So I tell them, you know, it can't be more important to me than it is to you. I can't make you do any of this. So if you're not, if you want to just keep throwing a pillow behind your knee when you're at home, when I'm asking you not to, then you're not going to be ready. And that's not going to be my fault. It's going to be, you know, so I really try to be very clear and and direct. And, you know, the good thing about pro sports is you do have the reinforcement. Um, And even on the collegiate level, a lot of times you have the reinforcement of other people saying, you know, hey, if you don't do this, then... XYZ is going to happen. 
Um, but you know, for the athlete, uh, the person that doesn't have all of that there, um, you know, I, I just kind of encourage them to, to look beyond, you know, just the pain and the, the discomfort in order to, to get, um, what we have to do in order to, to make it work. So I think it really just comes down to, to relating to each person individually too. Because for some people, you can just scare them and they'll be, <laughs> they'll take it. Other people, um, it takes some time. And I've had to have some of those conversations. I've had to tell some people, you know, look, if you can't do it, if you're going to insist on, you know, not doing the stuff at, at home, it's not my fault. It's not the doctor's fault. We're giving you what it is. So when you feel like you're ready, you come back and let me know. But in the meantime, you know, I'm going to let you you know, you're going to have to go over there while, while I work on somebody who wants to get better. Yeah, yeah. Usually once, if I get to that conversation, that means yeah. I've tried everything else. And usually after, you know, they've had a pity party for a few minutes, they're able to kind of get themselves together and, and come back to it. But I try not to do that. <laughs> Very yeah, often. It's frustrating to not do what you want to do. So I, I usually talk about it's totally fine to feel the feels, just like don't get stuck in it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And to be honest, knowing what's coming, knowing mm-hmm. the pain, knowing, sometimes I think to myself, I don't know if I could do this if somebody was asking me to do it or how I would feel about doing this. So I'm fully aware of that. And until I had, you know, some surgical procedures for myself, I was a very different therapist than I am, you know, ha- after having some surgeries and then like, oh, OK, <laughs> this is what it feels like. This is how hard mm-hmm. it is to motivate yourself to get up and to do. Um, but you know, at some point you, you still, you have to get over that and you have to move forward. Speaking of getting over it, mm-hmm. kinesiophobia, fear of re-injury, you've worked with <laughs> athletes like through the whole spectrum. So I'm curious, do you notice at different levels that kinesiophobia kind of subsides or is it totally dependent on the individual and their pain experiences and their rehab and how far out they are? Yeah, I I can honestly say that it's totally dependent on the individual as opposed to the level, especially if you get a professional athlete that hasn't really had a significant injury up to that point. It can be very, very challenging for him or her to be able to to really um, deal with that kinesiophobia and, and whatever's causing it, the pain the the fear avoidance the you know um, just the uncertainty of it all maybe they feel a little bit unstable um, so for me I think it's it's a combination of things right for some people you can just give them a cue and say you know oh on the opposite side you're able to like you're bending your hip how come you're not you know sitting into your hip on the other side oh okay I didn't realize I was doing it Somebody else might need a mirror. Somebody else might need you to put their hand, you know, on them and actually physically kind of guide them into. Some people need a combination of things. Um, I use a little bit of that. I use videos. You know, athletes are very used to, especially on the pro level, to reviewing videos, but even in the clinic. Um, So I try to do videotape as many things as I can so that they can look and say, okay, this is what I was seeing. Do you see that also? Oh, okay. I didn't even realize that I was doing that. Okay. But this feels like I'm off center. No, that's actually right. Your body has just trained itself to find a new center because of the, the injury, but this is where your normal center is and we have to reorient it around that. Oh, okay. I get it. Sometimes it's just being creative. Like I had a, a athlete not too long ago, who just could not get into like a hip hinge squat position on the inside, just could not do it. So myself and the strength coach, we're using all of these words and all of these cues and we're doing all these things and it just wasn't clicking. And finally, one day I just said, um, I said, you know, act like somebody's karate chopping you in the front of your hip and you sit down and they were like, oh, <laughs> That's what you want me to do. <laughs> that's all. That's all it took. <laughs> this, I mean, it, it was like weeks of trying to figure this thing out. And for some reason, 
that was the visual that clicked for them and they were able to correct it on the spot and almost have no problems <laughs> after that. So, so, you know, you just, you never know <laughs> what that thing is going to be. Yeah. Last time I've used the word karate, the phrase karate shop, but <laughs> for some reason it came to my head and it worked. So, so we, we have to have lots of tools in our toolbox because oh we need different things, different things click for different athletes. Yeah. For and sure. the other, I like your, what you brought up about the video. I use video all the time, slow motion, and it's really fun to show patients and athletes. They're like, this is what you look like now. And then review it in, in a couple of weeks or in a month and show them how much progress they've made. And then they get motivated and encouraged. Yeah, so yeah. Video, video is awesome to use in the clinic for sure. Sure. It's, it's instantly, you know, we kind of give that instant feedback and then it's, it's kind of allows them to track themselves, you know, mm -hmm. okay, this is what I look like on this day. And this is what I look like on that day. I'm also, I'm known for like getting on the floor and just kind of getting down on that level and just putting my hands around the knee or the ankle or whatever we need to do in order to guide it until they feel comfortable, you know, being able to, to do it for themselves. So um, so yeah, whatever, whatever stimulus what they respond to the most yep. is, is best. And obviously that's a little bit easier when I'm not also treating three patients at the same time, you know, so I may not necessarily have as much time to do that in the clinic as I do, but I still will try to do it. I don't, I don't want to neglect anybody just because of the, the environment. Mm -hmm. One of the cool things I think about working for MedStar Health is, you know, my clinic, the doctors are down the hall. Yeah. Everyone's just a quick call away. It's a nice, yeah. like, comprehensive teamwork going on. Sure. How, do, how does that affect the way that you treat? And, you know, obviously working in different levels, do you have access to those coaches and athletic trainers much more easily in the pro level? But how does that come into play in, in daily life, treating athletes in the clinic too? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a game changer. I think it's it's huge to be able to have a multidisciplinary approach to it because as long as I've been doing this, you know, over 20 years and as many people as I've seen in as many different circumstances, um, I still don't have all the answers, right? <laughs> um, and so I love being able to, you know, either call or just you know, go down the hallway and talk to the doctor or pulling a colleague and saying, hey, can you take a look at this too? Am I missing something? This is what we've been doing. Um, or even being able to talk to the strength coach and to the coaches and say, okay, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? Have you noticed any improvement in this? What would you like to do in the next, you know, week or two? How would that? So having those conversations in real time and being able to really put all of that together makes a huge difference. Um, I try to do that in a clinical setting or even with my high school students or, you know, if somebody wants to talk to me, here's my email, here's my phone number. If they have any questions, if they're not sure what you can and can't do. So I try to keep the communication as open as possible. Um, but yeah, it, it, it really, really matters to be able to have a situation where your providers can talk to each other. And if I have friends who may have, you know, torn their ACL or they're going to have a surgery of some sort, or they have kids who are going to have a surgery of some sort, um, I try to really impress upon them the importance of that and find a place, find a doctor, find a physical therapy office that has some sort of um, overlap like that because it does make a difference in the care that you're able to give. You talked about communication with the athletes and obviously we have to have boundaries. We can't be getting mm -hmm. texts at 11 o'clock at night, but I think kind of that line of communication might be more initially when the athlete's a little more fearful. And personally, like I'm okay receiving those messages. I'd rather the athlete reach out to me and ask. And eventually, mm -hmm. obviously, we have that education piece where they feel more independent and confident with their knee again. Mm -hmm. But how, how do you kind of handle that communication between yourself and the athlete mm -hmm. specifically and building that relationship? Yeah, I mean, again, I think it depends on the athlete. There's some, obviously, they're scared and they want to call and text about every single thing, right? Like, you know, is it normal for me to have 
yes, that's totally normal. That's fine. You know, is it, it, my knee looks like this. Okay. Send me a picture. You know, you kind of do that stuff and yeah, you kind of wean them off. But I think again, that comes from just the, even the first conversation of, you know, Hey, this is what's going on. This is what happens. Um, in our situation, a lot of times with the teams, you know, we're right there when it happens and then we're there when they go to the doctor's appointment and get that diagnosis or our di- you know, what our clinical impression is confirmed. Um, and so it kind of creates an instant um, bond, but I think that bond can be broken if there's not clear communication or if what the player, like what you're saying doesn't line up with what the doctor is saying doesn't line up with you know, nowadays everybody has the internet, everybody's going on and finding all this information. Um, so I try to be kind of careful initially. Like I'll give my thoughts about what's going on, but I'll always try to make sure that, you know, well, let's have a conversation with the doctor. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. You know, that's a good question. We should probably ask the doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, or in my experience, I've seen X, Y, or Z but every doctor's a little bit different. Every person's a little bit different. So I try to, to gauge those conversations very carefully um, so that I'm not saying one thing that's way out in left field. Um, and, and at the same time, I've had to do similar things in conversations with doctors, right? So a, a lot of times you have the doctor that's like, oh yeah, they're, you know, this many months they can go, they can, they can, start going back to play. And it's like, no, 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 don't tell them that (laughs) because they still haven't passed X, Y, or Z, you know, tests. They haven't been able to demonstrate blah, blah, blah. So let's not just tell them that please, you know, please impress upon them that they need to continue to strengthen their quad, that they can't just go from running straight ahead to pivoting and, you know, doing full contact just because, you know, they've passed the six month mark and, you know, they feel good. So I I just trying to have those conversations on both sides and develop that trust, I think is really important. We're talking about awesome things. I want to take it back to more specific ACL talk for a second. Graph choice. Uh, Not a lot of docs up in the North do quad tendon, but do you see a difference in athletes post quad tendon, teller tendon, hamstring tendon, allograft as far as rehab? So in my experience, I've worked with a lot of different doctors that did all, you know, just about every type of graft choice that you can possibly think of all the way back to doing the patellar tendon graft from the other leg um, to, you know, doing the hamstring. I have had a few quad tendons for um, younger athletes whose uh, whose growth plates may still be open. Um, and so I've had the opportunity to work with, um, you know, vol- multiple graft types. I've done a few double bundles, not a few, more than a few double bundles as well. Um, I think it really just depends on the person and the sport and their history. Um, So for instance, I used to work with one doctor who would shy away from doing um, patellar tendon grafts on people who had history of patellar tendonitis, right? One, to not, you know, irritate it too, because the tissue, the, the graft tissue may not be as um, as reliable if they've had, you know, repeated traumas and irritation to the tendon. Um, so then we may look at other graft choices. There may be other people who come in or their, their parents, if they're younger, their parents may come in and they've done a lot of research or maybe a sibling had a certain procedure and they want that procedure as well. And, you know, maybe the doctor, that's not their first choice, but they're willing to to go through. So I think it's a a conversation, but each one has their pros and cons, right? Um, As far as the rehab standpoint, I prefer patellar tendon or or bone tendon bone. Yeah, it can be a little bit more uncomfortable. 
um, a little bit more anterior knee pain early on, but I try to manage that with a lot of just manual therapy, a lot of um, soft tissue work, um, kind of being, I don't want to say conservative with the load, but the first couple of weeks, I may be a little bit more conservative than some in order to allow for that initial swelling and stuff to clear up. And then, you know, from there, I kind of take off and allow them to do what they can. Um, hamstring, hamstring grass for me, I, I probably, and I, this is just my personal preference. I don't like as much unless I've been able to spend a significant amount of time with the patient or the athlete beforehand, just because I find that the, the hamstring is already so tight from the injury itself. And I don't know if it's because it's trying to control some of that anterior tibial, tra tibial translation or what, but I just find that I already have to do so much work on the hamstring that once you take that graph and it's even more, you know, guarded, it's even tighter, it can just kind of create a, a, a little bit more apprehension. Yeah. Um, but I try to be flexible. You know, whatever the doctor and the athlete decide on, yeah. then that's what we're going to go with. And I'm going to work within those, you know, restrictions and we're going to move. <laughs> Either way, we're going to get this thing going. Yeah. <laughs> Either way. If you had to give a few tips to and hopefully new graduate or PT students are listening to this and new physical therapists who are trying to get into the sports world, what are a few tips you can give them to optimize how we treat athletes post-op ACL? Yeah, I would say don't rush to the to the big stuff. I find so many therapists, young and not so young, that move quickly to the big stuff, to the the single limb support, to even stuff like lunges and you know deadlifts and you know all of these other things, and the person still cannot demonstrate the ability to ambulate properly or their extensor mechanism is lacking or they've got a lot of substitutions at the hip or they're lacking ankle dorsiflexion or, you know, any of those things. I think that people just get so excited that we forget that there's a person in front of us that probably had some deficits before this and now those deficits are magnified on top of new ones. And we have to go back and get those things because if we don't, if we don't build a good foundation, if we don't really focus on, um, on stabilizing and the, the right coordination and sequencing of, of muscle groups and all that other stuff, then we're going to end up with problems down the road, be it, you know, tendonitis or low back pain or, you know, why are they running and they look like they're limping or, you know, any of those other things. And that's something that I had to learn as well, that I had to kind of check myself on and say, oh, you know what, maybe we didn't spend enough time, you know, in this phase working on these things. So I think that that's really, really a big thing of mine. It's, it's also kind of a pet peeve of mine if I see, you know, not necessarily in the clinical setting where I am now, but just you know, talking to people, I see a lot of patients who may be gone other places and then they, you know, come in and say, you know, it's been a year and my knee is still hurting and, you know, I'm still, and then you try to have them do like a single leg bridge or something like that. And they're falling all over the place. I'm like, well, this is probably at least part of the problem. <laughs> you know, you, you're able to do all this stuff, but you don't have a good foundation. So you're putting, you know, maybe there's too much accessory motion still happening at the knee or, you know, you're just not able to get in a position where your muscles can function, you know, optimally. So I think if I had one thing to say, it would be don't overlook the small stuff um, and, and don't get intimidated by the calendar. If they don't have it, they don't have it. Figure out what you need to do in order to get it so that they can progress to the next step. Testing is so important, whether you have a lot of technology or not, there's so many different ways that you can test, you know, single leg hop tests and the, the triple hop and the, the Y balance and the ex different excursion tests. All of those things are, are important and they give us some sort of information, right? So 
I think trying not to get caught up in the assumption that because one person is doing something, the next person should be able to also, um, and you have to be disciplined enough as a therapist to be able to explain to your patients why this is the case, why that, you know, I, that was <laughs> a huge thing. Well, they had surgery and how come they can do and how, why can't I do this? And how, you know, it's kind of like, okay, well, this is their situation. This is your situation. Yes, there's some similarities, but there are also differences. So it's great to be able to know that there's somebody on the table next to you that's going through a similar process, but you also have to kind of be able to separate some things out um, from that and know that I'm not going to give you the same things they have just because you all were both in the recovery room on the same day. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I'm going to need physical therapy from nodding my neck so much because I, I agree with so many things that you said today. Mm -hmm. I always, I, I love the advice that you just gave. And I, I try to also reinforce that it's kind of like a video game. Like you can't skip the beginning phase. Yeah. Like we have to earn the right to advance to the next stage. And yeah. it's, it's a you versus you. You can't, yeah. can, you can't make it go faster, but you can definitely make it go slower by Absolutely. trying to do things too quickly. Keep it simple. Absolutely. And we're going to see, we're going to see it eventually. You know, I used to always tell if you, oh, no, I didn't run today. Oh, you didn't? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, when it's time to run, I'll know. Mm -hmm. Because if you start having tendonitis and if your body starts swelling up, and th then I'm going to know that you did too much mm -hmm. early on because your body is now telling me that it's not prepared. So, yeah. and then, they, oh, okay, <laughs> well, I did jog a little bit, but that's because a car was coming, you know, then I get the whole story. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I love it. But, it's yeah. been an amazing conversation. I really appreciate your time. And I like to end with, what is a favorite quote or two that moves you, that you live by, that, that drives you, or that you use in the clinic to motivate people? Yeah, probably a little bit of, of what I was just saying. I, I always say to people, give your body what it wants or it's going to take what it needs. Mm. So, and usually when it takes it, it's not convenient, right? So there is something to be said about listening to your body, paying attention to the smaller things so that you can get um, what you need early on, because if your body doesn't have it, it will shut itself down. And that has to do with our mental health, that has to do with stress, that has to do with sleep, that has to do with recovering from an injury, all of those things, if we're sick, and we try to just push through it, you know, then eventually it's going to catch up to us and we're going to have to deal with something else on the, you know, a little bit further down the road. Um, so, yeah, that's one that I use a lot. Give your body what it wants or it's going to take what it needs. And that has become more and more true every year <laughs> that I live. <laughs> awesome. Where can people find you on the interwebs or in the yes. clinic? Where are you? Where are you these days? Well, on the interwebs, um, I can be found on Instagram um, at Team Sports Injury. Shows a lot of the behind the scenes things of like what I did at the Olympics and what I did in the bubbles and kind of just different sporting events and activities. Um, I can also be emailed, um, my MedStar email, if I can give that, is um, Kala, so K-A-L-A dot Y dot flag, F-L-A-G-G, -G, at MedStar.net. And then I'm also on LinkedIn. You can just look me up under my name. Thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Thank you. That was fast. <laughs> <laughs>